Hi there, thank you for taking time out to join me for this little Christmas Eve shedlet. We weren't actually supposed to be here in the shed at this time. Uh, we were supposed to be in London. I was taking, going to take a funeral in London on Wednesday, which I really wanted to take. And then tonight, I was meant to be preaching at midnight mass in uh, our home London church in Streatham. Thankfully, our lovely rector, Anna, has booked me already for next year, which is great. And then tomorrow we're going to be spending the day with uh, our daughter, Jenny, in Bedfordshire. But like many of you, all of our plans have been scuppered and um, it's crap. But hey, it is what it is. And um, so this is instead of Midnight Mass. And I want to tell you a story. It's a wartime Christmas story. Late in 1942, the German Sixth Army had reached the pivotal city of Stalingrad on the Eastern Front. Both sides knew that they must not lose this fight. Winter was setting in, but Hitler uh, made it absolutely clear that this city was to be taken come what may. The war in Europe seemed to hinge on the fate of Stalingrad. Well, by November, the German army was surrounded in what was to be one of the bloodiest battles in history. Starving people fled in all directions from the, that devastated city. Around half a million Russians and 147,000 Germans were lost. Many froze to death or starved in that awful icy hell. Dr. Kurt Ruber was a German military surgeon with the 6th Army. He was also a Lutheran priest and an artist who deeply opposed Hitler's regime but was conscripted uh, as a medic so he had no choice. He loved and respected the Russian people and felt great shame at uh, what his army was doing to them. He drew pictures of local people and sent them back to Germany to kind of humanize the enemy really. Well on Christmas Eve 1942 while working all the hours God sent in a makeshift operating theatre somewhere in Stalingrad, Ruber gathered a group of fellow soldiers for a Christmas service in an underground bunker. No Christmas tree, no candles, no presents or decorations. The service was really nothing less than an act of defiant hope in the face of horrifying reality. On the back of a captured Soviet military map, Ruber had drawn an icon now known as the Stalingrad Madonna and you can see here the folds in the map quite clearly visible. He based the image on a Russian mother that he'd seen at the side of a road somewhere who like Mary sheltered her vulnerable child in the midst of unspeakable suffering. After a short reading from Luke's Gospel against the noise of the battle overhead the small beleaguered congregation sang Silent night Holy night Join me All is calm All is bright Round yon virgin mother and child Holy infant so tender and mild Sleep in heavenly peace Sleep in heavenly peace. Well, with the earth trembling with bombs, pounding the city and gunfire all around, this was such a powerful declaration of defiant hope uh, as much as anyone could imagine. The icon on the back of a map of that devastated land was its own Christmas sermon. Around the icon, Reuben wrote the words, Light, Life, Love, in the cauldron of Stalingrad, Christmas 1942. It was a poignant protest at the hell all around, a sign of heavenly light and hope in a dark place, and a symbol of every mother's gift of life amid destruction. 
love is stronger than death. A few weeks after Ruber's Christmas service, the surviving German troops surrendered contrary to Hitler's orders. Two thirds of them died in Soviet captivity, among them Dr. Kurt Ruber, who fell ill with typhus and perished. But the Stalingrad Madonna survived, a Red Cross nurse on the last ambulance to fly out of the besieged city took the Madonna back to Germany, where it became a national icon and eventually found its place in West Berlin's famous Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church. Pat and I saw it there a few years ago, entranced by its simplicity and beauty, and also its smallness, actually. In 1990, the Bishop of Berlin brought a replica of the icon as a gift to Coventry Cathedral on the 50th anniversary of the Coventry Blitz. In the presence of Ruber's daughter, the, the then Bishop of Coventry joined the Bishop of Berlin and the Archbishop of Stalingrad in consecrating a new chapel with its message of life and love. Now it's the Millennium Chapel of the Stalingrad Madonna in Coventry Cathedral. Visitors are invited to sit and contemplate to pray for peace, to kindle stubborn hope, if you will, for our world. And in this mother and child to glimpse the mystery of a world transformed by love. Things change when someone has the imagination to re-envisage their reality. In his little book Images of Hope, William Lynch says that people in sorrow or depression suffer what he calls an impoverishment of imagination. An impoverishment of imagination. They simply can't imagine a world different from the one in which they are bound. Along similar lines, uh, the literary critic Hugh Kenner once wrote, whoever can give people better stories than the ones they live by is like the priest in whose hands common bread and wine become capable of feeding the very soul. Isn't that a wonderful quote? Whoever can give better stories than the ones they live by. I think we may be in danger actually right now uh, here in Britain, perhaps around the world, we're in danger of an impoverishment of imagination. With COVID and, uh, you know, the new variants that we're hearing about with more lockdowns, more scary statistics, all of this is threatening, I think, an impoverishment of imagination with a whole pile of mental health issues on the back of that. But if Christmas is about anything, guys, it's about the message of defiant hope the human capacity to transform uh, their situation, to trans transcend darkness and despair. We must keep on imagining something beyond this present depressing situation and not simply a return to the old normality, no, no, uh, but that a new and better normality will yet be born from this, from this smelly stable of coronavirus. So I invite you to um, spend a few more moments looking at this icon, contemplating it. It's a wonderful image drawn, believe it or not, with a piece of coal. That's right, drawn with a piece of coal. That was all that Karl Ruber had to hand. And yet when his comrades entered the bunker on Christmas Eve and saw it for the first time, they stood in silent awe as if in the presence of Mary herself and her child. The image filled that dark space. It portrays a mother and a child, heads leaned into each other, wrapped in the hood of her garment, which together with the mother's arm cradling the child seemed to form a heart shape around them. A sublime image of warmth and serenity, of security and mother love. The words from John's Gospel, light, life, love, in the cauldron of Stalingrad, articulate the defiant hope that this icon is all about. It's as if mother and child are enveloped in divine love. And you know, an icon is never simply a work of art, never merely something to hang in a gallery. An icon is a visual prayer. It's actually visual theology too but it's a visual prayer. It invites the onlooker to share in that prayer. An icon is really a sacrament. 
just like bread and wine can be thought of as a sacrament, a means of grace, something that mediates a life beyond, a greater life. I don't know what anxieties, what grief, what disappointment, what loss, what pain you uh, carry with you this Christmas, or what feelings of guilt or shame or failure that you may know. But this image invites you to place yourself in the arms of unconditional love. To place those you love in the feisty, gentle care of God, pictured in this mother. The writer Carol Hauslander composed a poem that could have been written while gazing at this Stalingrad Madonna. It's called The Circle of a Girl's Arms, and it stresses that not just in a manger in Bethlehem, Christ actually lies in every cradle. Every child is God's child. Every life, your life, is sacred and precious just because it is not because anything needs to be earned uh, or lived up to or qualified for, just because you are. The poem was composed against the backdrop of the First World War. And yes, Christ lies also, the poem affirms, in the cradles of our so-called enemies. There is that of God in everyone, friend, stranger, enemy, all alike. Is this not really what... Peace on earth means, isn't that what it means? The true message of Christmas. I've slightly altered the last verse of the poem to invoke the gentle lullaby of Mary's courage and love uh, in our world too. It goes like this. The circle of a girl's arms have changed the world, the round and sorrowful world, to a cradle of God. She has laid love in his cradle. In every cradle, Mary has laid her child. In each comes Christ, in each Christ comes to birth, comes Christ from the mother's breast. Into our hands, Mary has given her child. Heir to the world's tears, heir to the world's toil, heir to the world's scars, heir to the chill dawn over the ruin of wars. She has laid love in his cradle, answering for us all, be it done unto me. The child in the wooden bed, the light in the dark house, the life in the failing soul, the host in the priest's hands, the seed in the hard earth, the man who is child again, quiet, in the burial bands, waiting his birth. Mary, Mother of God, we are the poor soil and the dry dust. We are hard with a cold frost. Be warmth to the world. Be the thaw warm on the cold frost. Be the thaw that melts, that the tender shoot of Christ, piercing the hard heart, flower to a spring in us. Be hands that are rocking the world to a kind rhythm of love, that the incoherence of COVID-19 and the chaos of our anxiety be soothed to a lullaby and the round and sorrowful world in your hands, the cradle of God. Dear Shedsters, uh, I don't know if you've got a drink handy. I have, as ever. <coughs> Uh, if you have, I invite you to join me now. Let us toast the health of this, our glorious broken world, this Christmas. Merry Christmas, guys. Lachaim. Have a good one. And uh, I'll be back here in the shed, actually, on Sunday, if you're around. So uh, I'll see you then. Bye-bye.